Okay, greetings everyone in PLS 111. It's Saturday morning, the 14th of October, and what the plan here is, is for me to uh, change up the, uh, the one of the topics we're going to talk about, and that's growth and development, crop growth and development, and provide this material through the online or uh, as a computer file for you to take a look at and uh, uh, review and learn from on your own here. So my expectation is that everyone will have a chance to, to look through and become familiar with the material that's in this uh, video presentation by Tuesday the 17th. Today we're going to introduce a number of in very important uh, concepts and principles as well as some terminology that uh, that we all really need to be uh, familiar with uh, in understanding uh, agronomic production systems here. Uh, I, I won't say that, that farmers know all of this stuff in general that we're going to be talking about in some measure of detail, but by and large, being able to understand how crops are growing, how they're developing, and what some of the yield and productivity factors that go into uh, crop production, uh, it's very, very important. So the, the stuff we're going to talk about today is, is pretty important for us all to have a good handle on. Remember back to our very first day when I mentioned the, the book about plant hormones that uh, Dr. Fritz Wendt uh, uh, wrote and I didn't show you this picture but uh, in the next slide you can see that little poem we talked about. This little nursery rhyme was actually in the very first page in that book about plant hormones which was a very very important uh, biochemistry uh, book about how plants grow. So uh, remember we're trying to learn and understand at the field scale how the various crops we're considering this quarter actually grow and development and grow and develop. So keep that in mind. Just as a general kind of point of departure here, I want to ask you to think on your own maybe for a minute, uh, why would somebody be interested in understanding or being able to describe and, and uh, determine how plants are growing? Well, there are a number of reasons and, and practical reasons farmers want to know how their crops are growing, uh, when they're likely to, to be mature, when they can schedule harvest, how, uh, how things are looking, what kind of scale of harvest they're likely to have. So there are a lot of different reasons why not only research physiologists might be interested in this, but, but actual producing farmers. Now I want to remind you to, to go back to your basic biology classes where you learned about these processes, but growth of, of plants is defined as the progressive and irreversible process that is going to involve three main activities, cell division, cell enlargement, and cell differentiation. So all of those different processes are involved with crop growth and development. And this particular topic in our PLS 111 class allows us to really remind ourselves and get back to some real basic botany and, and crop physiology uh, concepts and principles here. Those plants that are considered dicotyledonous plants, all right, dicot plants that have two cotyledons when they come out of the, the soil and when they're emerging from the soil as seedlings. If you look right at the tip, this rounded dome, dome tip here, those cells that are at what's called the apical, the apex of that plant, that growing shoot or that growing uh, tip of the plant, those are called the meristematic cells. And those are the plant, the cells in the plant body that have the potential to become other cell types within the whole plant there. So for dicotyledonous plants, 
they have what's called an apical meristem, which is right at the tip, the growing point tip. And again, just to remind you, I know you've seen these kinds of cross-section images of different cells on a plant tip. But this is, these are shown in the dark red areas there, the apical meristem, where the arrow is pointing there. And they're the, at the apex or the bud or the growing tip of the plant. And as you move down through that plant body further down here, these are, could be the leaves or the stems that are going to be growing, but they all source themselves from that apical meristem uh, tissue at the tip of the plant. Now, cereal crops or monocotyledonous, monocrop plants, the grasses like we're talking about in our wheat project out in the field, they have little quite uh, different meristematic tissue. And the growing point, the uh, cells that are in grasses or monocot plants, they're actually located where you can see those three squares, one, two, three, on the left-hand plant there. So at each, what is called a node, and we'll look at that in the next uh, photograph here in the next slide, but at, at each node inside the stem of the monocot plants is where growth is actually occurring. And if you look very carefully from the left uh, image there to the center image and then to the right, you can see that those blocks of cells that label two and three right here, they're actually growing. That's where the growth is occurring in grass plants and then eventually differentiation is going to incur, occur. But they have a little different uh, meristematic tissue than the dicotyledonous plants. It's located in a little different place. And the meristematic tissue in cereals or grass plants is called intercalary meristem. And it's actually at this swollen area on the stem. If you feel the, the stem later on when the wheat plants are, are growing uh, bigger, you'll be able to feel or in corn plants when we bring corn in later on where these nodes are. And it's right in these areas of the meristematic cells right in here where the cell division and cell elongation take place. You have all seen this very well-known S-shaped curve or sigmoid function here that typically describes how plants grow and develop. So there are various different phases of growth and when the plant is enlarging and growing bigger uh, that are shown in this uh, this curve here, the typical S-shaped plant growth curve. Now again, some rather basic and almost intuitive kinds of uh, terminology, but productivity is the rate or the amount at, of which crop plants accumulate organic matter or biomass per unit area per unit time. How much material is the plant uh, amassing. Now the term yield, again, you all know this term and you use this readily, but it's the term that is used by farmers or people that are interested in the amount of a part of a plant that is of particular interest at the time when the, the, the crop is at a harvestable or uh, end of season, mature enough stage. So it's the part of interest, of economic interest, that is the yield. Now I've got to be careful, and we need to be careful, however, that to understand that not all of the plant body, not all of the plant biomass, or not all of the dry matter accumulation of crops is economic. So crop productivity or production is the rate at which a crop accumulates biomass, but it also, and that depends on the, the amount and rate of photosynthesis that is being turned into plant biomass. So again, the term yield 
is that plant part of interest? How much material is there? Is it the seed? Is it the whole plant? Is it the, the stem, the root? Uh, what the flower of the plant? The part that the farmer is interested in, that's called uh, the, the yield component. There may be, again, to re emphasize this point here, there can be both economic and non-economic yield, depending on what, what is being harvested and what the, the, the portion of the plant of interest is. A lot of times you'll see yield being broken down into what is called the biological yield, which is the total amount of dry matter produced per plant per given area, or yield can also be described as the economic yield. And that is the total amount or weight per unit area of a specific plant part or material that is of marketable value or use by the farmer. So the economic yield is that plant part or portion of the plant that is going to return uh, income to the farmer. Again, this is all pretty self-evident. So a few examples here just to illustrate how yield can be either biologic, biological yield or economic yield. So first of all, the crop sugar beet here, you could actually harvest the leafy tops and sell that as feed for animals, for instance, and that would become economic yield. That's part of the plant. But the por portion that is more typically of interest is the root, the sugar beet, the root of the plant there. That is also the economic yield component uh, of the overall bio biological yield. For the crop corn, you could also harvest everything, You could, in, in, which would become the uh, the economic thing as silage crop. That would be the not only the biological yield, but the economic yield. But typically, corn could be also harvested for the, uh, the grain on the cob, on the ear. And typically, you don't harvest the corn roots. Uh, so they would be part of the biological yield that's not an economic yield. For alfalfa, again, it's all uh, the leaves and stems and also the flowers, that's part of the harvested part for animal feed, but you typically don't harvest the roots for alfalfa. You've already heard me use the term biomass. The biomass of the plant is the quantity of organic matter that is produced by a plant in a given area over a given time period. So biomass is, is pretty much a very direct indication of how big the plant has grown. Now, this slide has lots of words on it here, but it's just a reminder to us all that uh, particularly for research and economic uh, determinations for farmers, the uh, biomass is dependent on the moisture content that is being weighed. So the, uh, the water content of whatever harvested or, or portion of the plant that is of interest needs to be taken into account uh, because plants can vary tremendously in how much water they have. And if, they, if that's the case, then you're going to get different sorts of, of weight measurements uh, when, you, when you weigh plants. Uh, and that's why typically for some standard is used. For instance, uh, we're going to be harvesting down here sorghum in the next uh, few days for a, for a research study here. Typically, you would report the yield or the, buy, the, the harvestable yield of that crop on a standard water content basis, maybe 14% moisture. Or another way that is often done in research, you would report your, your biomass on a dry weight basis. So you've eliminated the, the variability of water content and you put everything on a dry weight basis. So that's something very important to keep in mind. Now here's a practical example of what I mean by that. 
I remember being, this is a dairy farm that was being harvested a few years ago down in Hanford, California. I've mentioned Dino Giacomazzi, the farmer here, and his dad was telling us one day that that uh, they weren't very happy with this corn because it was what they called chopper man's corn. And what they meant by that was that it was so green, it was harvested for animal feed, for silage, for cows, but it was so so full of water, they, had, they hadn't let it dry down very much. Uh, they just had to get rid of it that the chopper, the harvesting company that was coming in to do this uh, chopping and removing of the crop, they were getting paid for all that water that was in the crop. So that's why, you know, they probably were very happy to see this easily harvestable green material, but the farmer was essentially paying to have water removed from the field there. So again, a, a real practical example where water content matters. Another very important term and concept for us to understand is shown here. And this is something that farmers, scientists alike will understand and be able to uh, talk about. The harvest index is defined as the ratio or the fraction of economic yield, that is the part, portion of the plant that's of interest to be harvested and marketed, divided by the total plant yield. Okay, so what portion of the total plant biomass is actually being harvested for the market value or the interest? You should know what the harvest index means. Now, many of you who are doing research work, you're already very familiar with these, this concept here, but just to give you a little bit more detail, uh, the harvest index is going to vary or it'll range between zero and one, the number one, so that you could you could have, uh, you know, you remove everything. All material is, is of economic value, so you'd have a, a harvest index approaching one. If it's only a certain plant part, let's say it's the corn grain, well, typically that's going to be a fraction of one, maybe 30, 40 percent of uh, uh, the overall uh, uh, biological yield. Uh, so it depends. A lot of things are going into the definition of the harvest index. Uh, a lot of things can lower the harvest index. If you have, for instance, high density populations, you know, this is relating to our field experiment already. Maybe a farmer could manipulate the plant population in a field so as to uh, be able to plant fewer seeds, but still get a high harvest out of that or a harvest index out of that. You may be able to manipulate the water stress in such a way that you can uh, change or alter the harvest index to your advantage there. So an example that you've all seen or heard about is creating shorter stature plants that still produce uh, a, a high amount of material, but they've actually uh, increased the harvest index by having less vegetative material in the plant. And again, depending on what is being harvested, up in the upper left-hand corner, all the, the that biomass that's down, that's coming out through the combine on the ground that was not in this field of interest there. It was the grain corn that's going into that trailer. But down in the right-hand corner, you could see that the farmer might have made a decision to actually bale up, uh, pick up that, that stover or that material, the stems and the leaves, and sell that as well. So then you'd get most of the above ground biomass being into the harvest index. Another important concept of crop production or agronomy it has to do with the components of yield. Remember, yield is the amount of material of interest that is produced or grown in a given area for a given time. And the yield components are typically, for the crops that we're going to be dealing with, made up of a number of different factors. 
And you can see them in that, that expanded uh, parenthetical term in the bottom here. The number of plants per unit area, the number of seed heads per unit area, the number of seeds per head per unit area, and the, the weight of those seeds. So each one of those uh, com, uh, factors is ultimately going to determine the overall yield there. And how does a farmer make sure that they're optimizing each one of those throughout the season? That's where the good finessing, the art and science of farm production comes into place to make sure you're and avoid having times during the season where you're jeopardizing or uh, diminishing the potential for high yields by what you're doing in your management. So keep in mind that there are a lot of different things that make up the yield, and we call those the yield components. So in, in, in a little different terminology here, you can see that Y, the yield, the letter Y here, is made up of a number of different factors. The number of heads, ears, or panicles, that, that are produced in a grain crop for grain yield here. The number of grains that each of those heads uh, have, and then the average weight of the grain. And on a, on a real, if you really wanna get down to understand what's contributing to yield and what's maybe uh, lost in terms of a yield, you really have to understand and, and analyze these yield components. Now, Monitoring crop growth, uh, for this is more or less a, a research or science uh, topic here, but there are generally a couple of ways of doing this. First of all, you can just go out and destructively harvest the amount of material that's in a field. You can uh, chop down and destructively remove, weigh, and, uh, and come up with uh, how much material is there. There are other more indirect ways that are called non-destructive methods of determining how plants are growing. And this is important for, for those of you who are going to be involved in research on plant growth and development to, to consider different approaches for determining growth. I remember when I was a student a long time ago at UC Davis, Dr. Robert Piercy, who was a professor of ecophysiology and, and really made this point and it sounds very simple but read carefully here you can tell a lot about how plants grow by harvesting them drying them and weighing them all right that sounds like a very simple platitude here but there's a lot of truth and a lot of value in that statement and otherwise in other words you know you have to make the determination so destructive harvests of plants while they remove plants from a field or from a study, you, t you get to learn a great deal about how plants have grown by doing that. And generally, as a researcher or a scientist, you're gonna, you're gonna face some trade-offs, some decisions about what kind of approach to take if you are gonna do destructive harvesting. Generally, there are a couple of uh, approaches that, that people end up uh, resigning themselves to taking what they're called the classical approach where you take fewer sample times because the labor or the the workload is just so great you can't sample very frequently or you try to take smaller sample sizes but you do it more frequently and that could be called the functional approach Here might be an example of the term functional growth analysis. And you can see this is actually biomass sampling done a little different way here. The same four experimental treatments were of interest, but the researcher took many, many, almost daily samples, but much smaller sizes samples. And so you can see that there's a little bit more uh, separation or discrimination of some of the treatments here. Uh, but you're sacrificing uh, the, the sample size here. So these are two approaches, and, and those of you who are involved in research, you already are well aware of the, the trade-offs that are involved with these different uh, procedures. 
Another way, and this is something that you're making use of in your Canopy Cover uh, camera applications, the Canopio app, but I want you to understand a little bit of the theory of how that is actually happening. What that camera is doing is it's measuring the ratio of what's called near infrared, NIR wavelengths, uh, with red wavelengths. And scientists know, those people that have studied this, that if you do that, if you separate the bands of wavelengths that reflect off of the soil, and that also reflect off of the plant material, green growing plant material, you can, you can pretty much segregate the pixels of light that are coming into that camera from the soil based on their, the ratio of near infrared to red wavelengths versus the plant. So this is right here, an image that shows sort of the mechanics of what that camera is doing when it comes up with these estimates of the amount of canopy development over the soil. Now this is another program. It's, it's actually called, uh, uh, well, Tetracam is the name of the camera there, but there are a lot of these things that are available on the market. And it just shows you take an image like your wheat in the field and you subject it to the, the different ratios of different red versus near infrared wavelength bands and you could pretty well and then you use some software to separate the soil background the darker spots there from the the plant material and you can come up with an estimate on that area for plant canopy cover so here this happens to be a vegetable crop maybe broccoli or cauliflower but you can see here that on the right they've used the software from the camera and the uh, the, the theory that comes with this, and they've separated some amount of canopy cover, the red now, they're no longer green, they've changed the color in the software program, but then they estimate the amount of leaf material on a given area background. So it's kind of neat to be able to do this non-destructively to determine how your plants are growing. And again, I don't know the exact mechanism here, but you can see on the camera shot here, or the phone shot, you're going from a green image here, and they're doing some manipulation with software to come up with an estimate of 76.64% of this area right here is covered by green plant material. So it's kind of a, a non-destructive, indirect way of estimating how the big the plant is. And here is actually, we use this the canopy cover estimates on a very almost daily basis here, but you can see lots of, lots of data points here. It happens to be an overhead sprinkler irrigation study with drip. And you can see early on when the plants were very small, they were growing at the same rate. And it only started separating the treatments here between the irrigation system sometime in June. And then you can start seeing that there must have been something that changed um, the water application availability or whatever but you can start to see how the the plants uh, diverged functionally and how they the growth was separated you wouldn't have been able to detect that uh, had you not had this kind of frequency of sampling so it makes the functional idea kind of valuable here now another principle of crop physiology is, is shown here, and that is that the crop should quickly produce enough leaf area to intercept most of the light for maximum dry matter production. All right, so that's an important pr principle of science, of crop physiology, but also of, of tr farmers in terms of trying to produce a crop. Get your crop uh, canopy or get the crop growing as early as you can in the season uh, to gain maximum advantage from solar uh, radiation interception. And again, that's, you know, lots of words here on this one here. You can read through this and stop the, the video a little bit here. But 
a very, you know, not only scientific, but also from a producer angle here, uh, that's what you're doing in farming. You're capturing sunlight, the energy from the sun, and turning that into energy in, in plant biomass or plant material there. And so the earlier you can do that in the season, the greater chance you're going to have to do it at a greater level. What kind of strategies are there for maximizing radi radiation interception? Well, you could plant early, all right, to establish an early uh, leaf area development. You can plant, and this is what we're doing, we're manipulating this in our own experiment in PLS 11, 111, is you can adjust the seeding rate to develop an optimal leaf area index. Uh, you can plant uh, at a time that's going to uh, provide a, a cover there. So you're not, you know, it may not be of interest to, to grow when it's very cold there, but you can optimize this uh, by selecting your, your growing period. You can also use fertilizer for, for helping the plant to grow at, a, at an optimal. Now, this is something those of you who are in horticulture and agronomy and in the graduate program and, and are looking at this in, in a lot of your different classes, you, you all know this already, but, you know, I'm talking very grossly and very generally about plant biomass and dry matter accumulation and yield. But, you know, when you really start understanding the different processes and uh, factors that contribute to that, there's an awful lot here. And, and each one of these little blocks, and many, many more for that matter, have been the, the areas of interest in lots and lots of very good research here. So uh, please appreciate that, that there's much more and deeper science that's involved with these general production processes that we're talking about in our class this fall. And it's all very, very interesting. Now this diagram is meant to show you that there are lots of uh, variations on plant populations that provide the farmer with what is called the leaf area index. That is the, the number of, uh, the, of the amount of leaf area per given area of soil. So a leaf area index of four means that there are four four times the area of soil that is covered by the, the area of leaves there on that particular crop canopy or that plant. So something like oats, you have a, a million plants per acre in order to achieve that same sort of canopy cover of that would be equivalent to a leaf area index of one. You would need fewer plants of sorghum to achieve a similar kind of a range of leaf area index. You'd only need 60,000. Whereas corn, because it's taller, it has uh, more, more layers of leaves, you would actually only lead, need uh, maybe 20 to 30,000 plants there. So adjusting the, the seeding rate to achieve a plant population that captures uh, sunlight in an optimal way is something that you need to be aware of and understand uh, so you're not wasting seed or you're not under planting. Now, this will be our last example here of terminology or concepts related to crop growth and development, but it's a very important one and you should understand this here. The term growing degree days and the equation that's given there in, in bold font there this is something that you can find lots of variations on the general concept of the general theme here. But it has to do with the, the following factors. Growing degree days, or sometimes you can hear people talk about them as heat units or degree days, are defined as, as indicated here and as variations of this kind of a definition here. But the daily maximum temperature plus the daily minimum temperature and that averaged or that divided by those two temperatures, the, the, the number two there, minus what's called the base temperature. 
So the base temperature is crop specific. It is based on a, on a given plant species or crop species. And that is generally determined as the temperature below which you're not going to have much growth at all. All right, so it's that threshold temperature that's needed for that, that organism uh, or that plant to grow, beyond which you're going to have growth. So how many growing degree days accumulate with a given maximum and minimum average temperature above the base temperature that's needed for growth? Now, the concept of growing degree days, or heat units, is also applied for other organisms, all right? Insects, pests, for that matter. Here's an example of the notion of growing degree days applied to uh, uh, an insect pest, a European corn borer, all right? So, the maximum temperature that was recorded on this day was 28 degrees. The minimum temperature for that day, that 24 hour period was 15 degrees. So you've got your first part of the equation, 28 plus 15 divided by two minus the base temperature, 10, for that particular insect or organism. When you do that computation, you come up with the number 11.5 growing degree days were accumulated for that day, for that given 24 hour period, for this particular organism or pest. So in order, for instance, for that, that insect pest to reproduce, it might need, let's say, 250 growing degree days for it to, to, to reproduce and, and grow to the next generation. So you've already got 11.5. This is how growing degree days are used. Now let's take an example here, and this is actually from some research that a, a colleague, a farm advisor, uh, has conducted for a number of years. And what her interest here in the San Joaquin Valley was, is to figure out if farmers could reliably grow two crops of corn in a given summer season. So her question was, is there enough heat? Is there enough sunlight energy and or growing degree days to grow two corn crops? That was her question. So let's look at how she approached this in a little bit more detail. So here's her basic question. Do you have enough growing season to produce silage corn from two specific plantings? Can you squeeze in a second or double crop? And do you have enough energy to do that from the sunlight? So here's the basic calculation that she used. She said a growing degree unit is defined as the average of the high and low temperatures each day that are higher than a base of 50 degrees. And for corn, for this particular crop, any high temperature above 90 degrees is counted as 90 in the calculation because it's, it's been figured or determined that that's, it's not adding any more to the calculation. Now, this is something very interesting, actually. There's a lot of detail here, so let me go slowly with this for you there. What she has uh, compiled here is, is kind of a very interesting data here. But in order to grow a full season corn crop, that's one crop that's going to take roughly 120 days, you really need anywhere between 25 uh, 2560, 2560 to 2600 growing degree units to complete that corn crop. If you've got that much solar energy, heat units, you're going to finish the crop will grow and develop and uh, be harvestable as full season corn. In order to grow a short season crop, that's 30 degrees or 30 days less, you only need 2,200 to 2,300 growing degree units. 
So the challenge here is if you look in these different columns, if you plant on March 1st, your first corn crop, and you go down to where you come up with, where would it be? Right about July, between July 15th and July 20th, 30th, you would accumulate 2,600 growing degree units. The question then becomes, do you have enough season? Do you have enough heat units after that to plant your second crop? And I can see for some reason the, the, sh the bold or the uh, color coding is not coming out here, but I'll have to go over this a little bit more in class here. It didn't come out in this video uh, recording program here, but I hope you're getting the idea that what, what you've got to figure out is depending on what the planting date for your first corn crop would be, and that is going down throughout the, the season here on that slanted uh, lowering column progression, uh, will you have enough growing degree days uh, to finish off the second crop? And it, that's what this calculation is all about here. So her conclusion was that for most plantings at this particular part of the San Joaquin Valley, which was down by the Modesto area, she said that it would be unlikely that you'd have reliably enough growing degree units for two corn crops. So that was her advice to farmers. You're probably not going to be able to do it with current genetics and current uh, heat unit uh, accumulation characteristics. Now, I want to end here this discussion with yet another concept of crop growth and development that is very important for us to be familiar with and to understand. And that has to do with the notion of what are called, what, what is called crop growth staging, S-T-A-G-I-N-G. -G. The determination, the description, and the understanding of what stage of growth and development a given crop plant is at. And here you have some really nice uh, images here for wheat growth and development and some of the important stages that are involved with how wheat grows. So I think you should become familiar with this drawing here. I think you should use it in looking at how your plants, at what stage they are out in the, uh, the lab field there. And to begin to become familiar with uh, determining how you go about uh, describing where a cereal plant like wheat is. So let's look at the from the left to the right here as the plant is uh, growing and developing and maturing. You see, first of all, the sowing of the seed, the planting of the seed in the ground, the emergence, which we maybe some of you saw that first week there, but the first uh, plant, the first tiller, the tiller is that uh, leaf or shoot structure that's going to come out. And then the eventual, you're not going to be able to see this from a, a, a just walking across the field there, but there's uh, the fluorescence. The, the seed head is actually developing inside the, the growing wheat plant quite early. So that's actually, you know, it's shown by between four and five weeks there. That's when the, the, the yield starts developing within the, the, the plant body there. And you go through the rapid growth phase where the plant biomass is increasing uh, considerably and lots of other subtle things that we probably aren't going to have time to see because we're going into the a, a, a much later uh, colder time of the year. So these are all going to be adjusted uh, accordingly here, but we'll, we'll see how far we get into this uh, process of development. Now, the last two concepts I want to give to you here are shown here. And there are some really elaborate and very detailed. And I know that at least a couple of students in our class are doing some of this kind of work for their own research work. But 
the the notion of crop growth stages for cereals can be and has been very very uh, elaborately uh, determined and defined and one of the 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 formats for doing that is called the Zadox decimal code system which is shown here so you you're do, using a a very uh, uh, prescribed system of uh, rating what stage of growth and development using a, a two a digit uh, system here so you have everything from emergence up here zero zero the dry seed is sown then you finally uh, get up to the seedling stage and again each one of these is very carefully uh, defined and you can use these in your own determinations take this chart out to the field and use these to see if you can come up with the the Zadok value or code for the stage of growth that your your plants are in the different systems that we have out there are developing at you can get if you get down to the st stage three the 30 digit numbers three zero to three nine this when the stem is elongating so we're probably not going to be able to get even that far with our our crop this year but that's when the plant starts growing taller and you're having different nodes that develop eventually the the the, the plant would start sending out uh, a, la a flag leaf there would be the formation of the head inside the stem and then it would emerge the hem would the the head would emerge and you'd start seeing flowering take place then you'd have the kernels and being filled uh, with photosynthate and water and then the the ripening process where the kernels would start drying down here so I put this out here to, for, to let you know that there are lots of very very detailed ways of describing crop growth and development and one of the most advanced ones is for for cereal grass crops so another approach to doing staging of crops or cereal crops uh, other than the zadok two-digit system is the feex scale f-e-e-k-e-s and you can see here uh, uh, the the correspondence or the relationship between the Zadox two-digit system and the Feek system. Now you'd you might be asking yourself, gee, that seems to be a lot of detail, and I'm not sure I can ever get a handle on that. But I want you to know that not only is it important from uh, a research perspective and understanding at what stage the plant is at so you can accurately describe that but think about this here what's shown here from a farmer's perspective it's important for farmers to be able to detect and know what stage of growth and development their crops are at for something as practical as uh, herbicide use all right you can only use or certain herbicides as shown here are typically only and can be either for physiological reasons or, or legal reasons maybe used at certain times of the year there so you have to have a handle on what stage of growth and development your crop plant is actually at there for real practical application reasons as shown here 